good. Uh, good evening. My name is Lauren Wilkling. I'm one of the Education Commission co-chairs. Um, we are happy to welcome you all to the last of our 10 monthly virtual CME sessions. And we're excited to have Dr. Winfred Frazier here with us to present uh, primary care dermatology and skin of color. So I personally have been looking forward to this one since uh, we planned it a while back. So uh, no pressure there, Dr. Frazier, but we're happy to have you. Um, tonight's presentation is delivered live and Dr. Frazier will be available for questions following the talk. Uh, feel free to drop any questions into the chat window as they come up during the presentation and I'll monitor those and moderate them at the end. But you're also welcome to speak up and ask questions directly at the end of the presentation. Uh, participation in tonight's presentation qualifies for up to one live prescribed CME credit, and the session is being recorded and will be uploaded to the MAFP's YouTube channel for future reference. But you do have to be watching it live tonight to claim CME. So um, at the end of the session today, if you would please complete the very short survey um, that Bill will um, include the link in the chat session, that is your ticket to get your CME reported. So Information entered there will be used to report your CME to the AAFP, and because this is the last of the 10 series uh, CME, that should happen after this session is complete. And lastly, I look forward to seeing all of you at the annual fall conference in just a month or so, November 7th through 9th at the Intercontinental Kansas City on the plaza. Um, it's going to be a great time. There's an optional interactive procedures workshop, um, OMT for all physicians, happening the Thursday preceding the Friday and Saturday talks. Looking really forward to that and hope many of you can attend as well. Uh, if so, if you've not already done so, hurry up and register for this great conference uh, with in-person CME, shopping on the plaza, great fellowship with Family Medicine Physician and Celebration of Family Medicine at our Roaring Twenties Gala uh, with Silent Auction. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Frazier. Yeah, thank you so much for that warm welcome. And that gala sounds really nice. Like if I were in the area, I would definitely, definitely want to join that. Um, so yeah, and I, I just wanted to thank um, Kento and also Bill for inviting me and coordinating. Um, it's been very smooth and easy um, to do this. Um, so once again, um, thank, thank you guys as well. All right, so I'm going to share screen and see if see if this works i feel like this is always like the hardest part um <laughs> making sure this works so we'll we'll see you guys let me know though got that that good looks good all right how does that look perfect looks perfect okay yep all right. So, um, so as you mentioned, uh, my name is Winfred Frazier. Um, I'm a family medicine physician in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, but I've lived kind of like all over the place. Um, but here I am now. Um, I'll be talking to you about primary care dermatology and skin of color. It's one of my primary clinical interests, but also scholarly interests as well. Um, so thank you for joining me. And I hope we have a very fruitful discussion. Um, I'll be looking at the chat intermittently, and I'm also happy to answer questions kind of at the end. I was of the trying to use up this honey, but. All right, I'm going to get gonna started. So in. just a quick reminder, if all attendees could please make sure they're on mute. Yeah. Um, all right, so I have three learning objectives um, that I will focus on today. So um, by the end of the talk, um, we will have examined factors that contribute to skin of color health disparities. Um, discuss common, common dermatological conditions in skin of color, and finally identify skin of color educational resources. Um, I put this kind of graphic here. Um, so me and some of my colleagues, we published in the American Family Physician um, on this topic of January 2023. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that, you know, I've I've really studied and really interested in this topic, and I'm glad that there's a lot of um, forums um, that are welcome with this type of topic, because I think it's such an important um, educational topic. All right, so first I'm gonna talk about what does skin of color mean? And it's a very broad <laughs> definition, so I'll just, I'll just put that out there right now. So it's, it means skin of color refers to a diverse population of racial and ethnic backgrounds including but not limited to those who identify as Black or African American, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian American, Pacific Islander, 
Latinx and Middle Eastern or North African. So it's it's very broad. And like I said, it's not limited to these um, racial or ethnic groups. Um, I also wanted to highlight this, this amazing medical illustration that, that was done by um, Chidiya Barry Ibe. He's a medical student. And this, this image went viral in about 2020 because you know, people had never seen a black fetus kind of in illustrated in such a way. Um, so he does just amazing illustrations, um, specifically of skin of color. He published a book recently. Um, so he's just amazing. And I'm going to highlight um, some more of his work um, throughout the presentation. So just wanted to highlight that. Um, it just kind of like broke the internet a few years ago when, when, when he posted this. All right. So um, the Fitzpatrick scale is kind of the gold standard, so to speak, of how we kind of identify different skin types, like medically speaking. Um, it's been around um, since the 70s. Um, it is a classification based on your propensity for photodermatitis or sunburn. The scale should not be used as a surrogate marker for race and ethnicity. We know race is a social construct. It's a human invented classification system. There's no racial differences in the number of melanocytes that we all have. It's just a matter of how the melanosomes transfer the melanin and how it's dispersed in the dermal and epidermal layers that provide us with, with our many colors. Um, the skin of color, um, when we talk about skin of color, it's usually referring to Fitzpatrick types four through six. Um, so that's just some background about kind of the scale how we use it, how it was formed, um, and how, how we identify the skin of color based on the scales. But they're, they're definitely newer scales. Um, so you can see that this scale has six different skin types. Um, but kind of one of the newer scales is called the Monk Skin Tone Scale. Um, so this obviously has 10 different types and it's, it's more inclusive. Um, so Dr. Monk is a sociologist um, at Harvard who does research focusing on social inequities with respect to race and ethnicity and wanted to address some of these biases. Um, he also does extensive research on skin tone and colorism. And so he kind of wanted to expand the scale to promote inclusivity. Um, he also wanted to improve some of the AI machine learning algorithms, which we'll talk about later, um, and to reduce some of the biases. So this is all to say that the Fitzpatrick scale is kind of the gold standard, but there are newer um, scales that are more inclusive of kind of the different broad um, skin types that, that we have. And so just wanted to talk about like the importance of dermatological education in primary care. I, I, I probably don't have to tell you guys, but like, it's, it's so important. Like, so number one, skin conditions account for like eight to 12% of all diagnoses seen by family physicians. I mean, you can just like look at your patient panel today and you're like, out of the patients I saw, like how many of those patients had skin complaints, right? And probably at least one or two, if not more. Um, so during a two-year period, 37% of patients will present to their PCP with at least one skin complaint. 59 of those patients will have one that skin concern as their chief complaint. So we see this all the time. It's super important to address. Um, and so like obviously in family medicine, there's a lot that we can do, right? Like we don't necessarily have to refer our patients to derm. Like, you know, if we can handle it, I mean, number one, there can be long wait times to see dermatology. Um, you know, in, in our health system, we have derm e-consults, which that helps. I don't know if you guys have that in Missouri, um, but there's also accessibility issues like transportation issues to get there or, or our patients are like, we just want to see you. Like, can you take care of this? Um, we have a relationship with you. We trust you. Um, so there's a lot that we can do um, and don't necessarily need to refer to derm. Um, so they did a study um, where they showed like a dozen pictures um, to family medicine attendings, family medicine residents, and dermatologists. Um, so we, family medicine physicians, we correctly diagnose 70% of skin conditions compared to 93% of dermatologists. Obviously, we're not, we're not dermatologists. We don't have the training that they do. However, there's a lot of training that we do have. We see a lot of skin conditions. We, we do like professionalism and development and do CME like this to increase all knowledge. So this just goes to show that it's very important um, to continue this education um, as we progress. And so you guys have probably seen this graphic before, um, but there's increase in skin of population across the US and abroad. Um, so it's, it's projected 
by 2045 that non-Hispanic white uh, people will no longer be the majority in the U.S. Um, skin of color already comprise the majority in several states, California, Nevada, Texas, and Georgia. Um, it'll soon comprise the majority in other states like New York and Florida. Um, so just over time, we will see more skin of color patients. So just another reason why it's important to kind of be familiar with conditions that um, are more common in skin of color or predominantly affect skin of color patients. So unfortunately, kind of like other fields in medicine, like, you know, we talk about, you know, mat maternal and child health. We talk about diabetes and CKD health disparities. Um, dermatological health disparities exist and uh, unfortunately are common as well. So I'm just going to give you a couple examples. Um, African-American patients with atopic dermatitis were less like to, likely to receive desinide, topical calcineurin inhibitors, and dupilumab compared with white patients. Latinx patients with acne were less likely to receive tretinoin compared with non-Latinx patients. African-American patients were less likely to receive biologics for psoriasis. Um, and then finally, this is a very common statistic that you guys have probably seen, but there's a huge disparity in melanoma survival rates. So 93% um, for white patients and 73% for African-American patients. And unfortunately, this has been consistent over a long period of time and it's not really improving. Um, so many disparities, um, and unfortunately some of them are not getting better. So then that begs the next question. So why, why do these disparities exist? So what is, what is the reason we have these disparities? And so, so the first disparity I wanna talk about, or the first reason is systemic racism. So, so I posted the graphic of the article that I published in AFP um, in 2023, and when I published that article, I received two emails like pretty soon after, and they were pretty scathing. And they were like, you know, I'm I'm summarizing, but they're like, how dare you say that, you know, physicians are racist? Like, we're not racist. And, you know, in my decades long of being a physician, I've never seen racism. And yeah, they were they were fired up. And and um so, because I do talk about systemic racism in that in that article. And so um, so number one, I, I don't say that physicians are racist, <laughs> number one. But, but number two, um, I kind of think of systemic and structural racism as, as an iceberg, right? So there's, there's the top of the iceberg that's, you know, above the water, that's visible. So these are like the obvious forms of racism, like racial slurs, hate crimes, like some of the obvious forms of racism that are easily identifiable. But systemic racism is kind of like the bigger underbelly of the iceberg that may not be visible um, to the people it it doesn't affect. So it's kind of the more um, invisible. So so this is what I'm talking about, like the the pervasive and deeply embedded systems, um, the laws, the unwritten policies, and written policies that are entrenched in our beliefs and practices that perpetuate widespread um, and unfair treatment of um, skin of color patients. And so examples of these are. Um, unfair lending practices, um, residential discrimination, um, environmental justice issues. So there are many different issues that can contribute to systemic racism. Um, so I definitely wanted to highlight that. Um, the second thing, which I kind of already touched on, was lack of physician education on diagnosis and treatment of these conditions. And so there's been a lot of studies. If you look at dermatological textbooks um, and the images that are in those textbooks, the vast majority um, of the images are of lighter skin types. Um, unfortunately, on the flip side, um, skin of color patients are overrepresented um, in STI images um, in those textbooks. So, so if, if you don't see images of skin of color, it's gonna be hard for you to learn it because obviously dermatology is just so visual. Um, you need to see um, the repetition of images uh, to be more familiar. And then finally, lack of high quality evidence-based research on dermatological conditions affecting skin of color also plays a role um, in these disparities. Okay, so we all know about new technology and new diagnostic options that always come about. And so AI is kind of one of the newer, exciting, burgeoning technologies that we're like trying to figure out, um, is this useful, is this not useful? Um, it's kind of up for debate right now, um, but it's definitely here to stay probably. Um, but we have to think about, 
you know, who do these technologies benefit and who these technologies necessarily don't benefit. Um, so unfortunately, AI algorithms in dermatology perform worse on lesions in skin of color. And, and that's because there's underrepresentation underrepresentation in these data sets. So there can be millions of images um, in these AI data sets. But uh, again, you may have a very small percentage of those images represent skin of color patients. And so unfortunately, at least at this point, they don't perform as well. Um, so you just have to think about like, you know, with these newer technologies, what are the limitations? So I wanted to point that out. Um, I also wanted to put in this like cautionary slide and I'll, I'll have a couple of examples of skin conditions so we can kind of compare and contrast. But I think oftentimes, not just in dermatology, but just like all fields of medicine will typically label conditions as classic. We'll say like, this is a classic, you fill in the blank. Um, and our words as physicians um, and educators, because many of you probably work with residents and students, um, kind of are what we say matters. Um, so I think when we use the term classic, we are often referring to what conditions look like in lighter skin types. Um, so it's just really important not just to rely on color um, because color can definitely lead us astray. Um, so I think it's really important to kind of focus on other things besides color, like morphology and symptomatology. Um, so if you look at this image, um, I don't know about in uh, Missouri, but in Pennsylvania, we have Lyme disease like pretty much all year round. Like we see it all the time. So this is kind of a, what we call a classic, you know, bullseye rash, right? So erythema migraines, you have that ring in the middle with the clearing and then kind of the bullseye rash in the middle. Um, but if you look at this image, right, there is no erythema to be found at all, right? Um, so if you just look at the erythema, that would kind of lead you astray, but the morphology is very similar, right? So you still have the bullseye rash, but you don't have the erythema. So this is just an example to not just rely on color because again, that can lead you astray and lead to kind of like underdiagnosis, delayed diagnosis that can have negative implications for the patient. Um, so just another example, um, if you look at this image, kind of think in your mind, kind of like what, what you see, how you describe it, um, think about kind of what differential you would come up with. Um, but basically I see kind of like very kind of clustered papules on the cheek. There may be a kind of a hint of erythema. Um, so compare that to this image um, where you can clearly see the telangiectasias um, that are kind of all throughout the cheek. Um, so both of these images represent rosacea, right? Um, and rosacea in skin of color patients is not, is not uncommon at all. Um, but the erythema is just more difficult to see. Um, so there's a couple things that we can do to kind of better see erythema um, in skin of color. So you can use dioscopy where you kind of put a slide um, anywhere on their skin um, to see if it blanches. So that's another way. Make sure to have really good lighting um, when you're evaluating skin conditions. Um, but it's just, it's just really important to say because rosacea is often underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed um, specifically in skin of color. So just wanted to be awareness of the differences. Another example is this image. And so this is kind of a little kid's leg. You see these kind of well demarcated patches um, on the leg. That's kind of like grayish, uh, maybe a little violaceous and brown in color. Um, so you see that and then you compare this image. And so this image you see erythematous, um, also patches, you see some excoriations. Um, so both of these, are atopic dermatitis, right? And so I think oftentimes we associate dermatitis with like, you know, a red rash that's itchy. Um, so, so again, um, it's important to think about different um, morphology, like, is it itchy? Um, you wanna think about well demarcated, um, you wanna think about location. So obviously like, you know, in kids, you know, you see it mostly on the cheeks and then the next stage you see it kind of on the extensor surfaces that they're like kind of like crawling. Um, and then you see it kind of on the flexural surfaces like you do to the right. So just another example. I think I have one more example. And so, so the image on the right, you have the, you know, classic pink salmon, well demarcated plaques on the kind of extensor surfaces. Um, but the other image, um, you have more of a violaceous gray brown 
um, still well demarcated, still kind of plaques, um, but definitely not erythematous, not salmon colored at all. Um, so again, so both of these represent psoriasis, um, but they can look very different um, in skin of color patients compared with um, patients with lighter skin types. All right, so I just want you guys to take a look at these three images, right? And so you take a look at these images and you're like, okay, these could all be, these could be concerning, right? So this could be melanoma, this could be melanoma, and, and, and this could be melanoma too, right? Like they all could be concerning, but only one of these is melanoma and life-threatening. And so the first one is called, um, is talon noir, or basically a calcaneal hemorrhage. And so you can get a condition like this um, due to like shear forces. So people who do sports, people who wear tight shoes um, can get this condition. And diagnosis and treatment is very easy. You just take kind of a 15 blade, you just pair off the stratum corneum and you evacuate the hemorrhage and, and, and that's done. The middle, the middle image is melanoma. So obviously like that is, can be very concerning, life-threatening, um, need to do a biopsy, get them to dern as soon as possible. And the image on the right is kind of melaninicia, which is an overall benign condition. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of these conditions in a minute. So another, another thing, we're just looking at kind of male conditions. And so the image to the left is a subungal hemorrhage. The history will give this away. You know, I slammed um, the car door or a door on my thumb. So that's that's pretty clear. The middle one is uh, melaninicia. So normally um, the melanocytes in your nails are dormant, right? So you usually don't have any hyperpigmentation in the nails, but due to some um, systemic issue or medication issue, um, people can get um, melanicia on their nails. Often if it's just melanicia, um, you can get it on multiple nails, that longitudinal band, um, as opposed to the image on the right, um, which is melanoma. And the image on the right has something called Hutchison sign, um, which you probably guys know, where the hyperpigmentation kind of affects the either the proximal nail fold or the lateral nail fold. And in this situation, the melanoma is like affecting the integrity of the nail itself. And so just wanted to you guys to be aware of the differences and kind of like benign, so to speak, and, and non-benign issues um, when it comes to nails. Um, so, so ALM, um, so obviously with melanoma, um, skin of color patients have a much lower prevalence of melanoma in general compared to lighter skin types. But when um, skin of color patients, specifically African-Americans get melanoma, um, it tends to present at a, or be diagnosed, I should say, at a later stage. And I already talked to you about the mortality differences. Um, so misdiagnosis, delayed diagnosis um, can delay treatments. And so, I mean, and so the most common um, area of the body to get melanoma in skin of color patients is the sole of the, the foot. So obviously as physicians, we're not, we're not looking at the sole of the feet often. I mean, we're doing like monofilament tests and I'm not saying we need to like look at everyone's soles, um, but just like, you know, but if you see something, you know, go through the ABCDEs, you know, really evaluate if this could be um, melanoma. All right, so I just wanted to name just like a bunch of skin conditions that are either common um, in skin of color patients or more prevalent in skin of color patients. Like, obviously I don't have time to talk about all of these conditions, but I just wanted to at least put like a column just, just so you're aware of them. Um, I'll be kind of focusing on these five conditions um, for the remainder of the talk. And so just wanted to put out, these are also common um, in skin of color patients. So pseudofilliculitis barbae is um, one of the ones I'm going to talk about first. And so this is a condition where you get these follicular papules, you'll get pustules kind of on the anterior lateral neck um, and usually presents a few days after shaving. And this is usually kind of like a, a chronic condition. Um, the differential for this condition is um, you can get tinea barbae, you can just get a bacterial folliculitis. Um, you can also get just like irritant dermatitis or razor burn, like all, all three of those conditions usually resolve fairly quickly, um, within days to weeks, as opposed to pseudofiglex barbae, which usually lasts like months. Um, and it, it usually affects this area because the hair is more coarse. Um, but it can also affect, uh, the pubic area if you shave there or pretty much like any area where you shave, it could affect, but the facial neck area is the most common, um, 
54 to 83 percent of African American men are affected. So this is very common. Um, and also, unfortunately, um, pigmentary sequelae is also pretty common. So patients with this condition can get post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Um, patients can get keloid development here. Um, so there's a lot of sequelae um, if this condition is not treated. So um, there's two different mechanism, mechanisms where people can get this condition. So one is extra follicular penetration, where basically the hair um, kind of comes around and goes back into the skin, um, causing a foreign body reaction. Um, so that's one mechanism. The other mechanism is where the hair retracts underneath the skin and then pierces the follicular wall and causes inflammation. Um, so there's two different mechanisms um, whereby this happens. And so oftentimes when we're talking about treatment options, in theory, we tell people to like stop shaving. We're like, stop shaving for like six to eight weeks, the hairs will grow out and the condition will pretty much like get better. Um, but obviously like this is not paternalistic medicine. We don't just tell people what to do. This is shared decision-making. And some people either don't wanna stop shaving or due to their jobs, professions, they're not able to. They might be in the military. Um, they might be a healthcare worker who has to wear N95. So that's not always an option. But in, in theory, it's good for them to either stop shaving or shave less close. So, so if people want to shave, I have kind of a list of education that is very important uh, to improve um, this condition. And unfortunately, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> um, but if, if people go through this steps, it will really help this condition. So firstly, gentle cleanser, exfoliate the skin, get any of those like dead, dead hair cells kind of out of the hair follicle. Um, apply a warm washcloth to the area for five to 10 minutes. I, I also tell people just like, you know, take a shower right before you really want to just like flood the hair follicle with like warm water. This makes the hair kind of like stand straight up. Um, it makes the hair softer. It goes, it makes it less pointy. Um, and it's just a more even cut. So that's a really important part of the process. You want to apply a shave cream or gel. So you never want to like dry shave. And, and the shaving itself. So electric razors are usually less close. Um, so you could recommend um, electric razor and it's more even. Um, but if you wanna go with a traditional razor, make sure they have a skin guard that reduces kind of like tug and pull that you can get that can kind of make this, the, the hair retract and cause that transfollicular penetration. Other, other educational things I tell patients, don't shave over the same area twice. Don't pull the skin taut, short gentle strokes, apply gentle pressure. Um, so these are all just like educational things that I talk to my patients about. Rinse the skin. You want to get all that shaving cream gel um, in case that causes any inflammation. You want to apply a moisturizer. And then finally, you want to do a circular massage. Um, this kind of like, kind of un... Any, anytime there's hair that could be stuck, it kind of like unsticks those hair, just doing a little massage afterwards. So I realize these are a lot of steps, um, but like going through this is very important and can make a big difference. All right, so other like treatment options that don't involve kind of changing shaving practices. If there's any evidence of follicular papules, um, they can apply low dose steroids, topical calcineurin inhibitors, if there's any concern about steroid use. Um, benzoyl peroxide washes are really good, as you guys know. Benzoyl peroxide is um, antibacterial and anti-inflammatory. A lot of the treatments for this is kind of mirrors um, some of the treatments for acne, by the way, um, but also kind of topical diclofenac, same concept, reducing the inflammation. Um, consider chemical depilatories like Nair. Um, as you know, these are kind of like short-term short, short -term options, um, but the hair will regrow over time. Um, chemical exfoliants are really good, like glycolic acid and retinoids. Um, as you know, some of the retinoids are over the counter. Um, and laser hair removal is definitive treatment, but oftentimes that's very expensive and people don't want necessarily to never have hair on their face again. Um, so these are just some options um, that you can offer your patients to help treat the inflammation. In the image, you can kind of see the extra follicular penetration where that hair is kind of like curving around and going back into the skin, um, causing that papule formation. So that's kind of like a microscopic view of, of the mechanism behind this condition. Also want to talk about traction alopecia. Again, a, a very common condition um, that's really reduced, um, really due to like hair care practices. Um, so it's a reduced density of hair in the frontotemporal scalp. Um, 
And so this is usually due to kind of chronic pulling and chronic tension um, that causes breakage of these hairs. And usually it affects this area because the hairs are are more fine or more delicate. You know, we call them baby hairs. Um, so that's why it, it affects that area. Um, so people with kind of like tight braids, tight ponytails, any weaves, any people with tight scarves or tight hair bands, people who use tight sponge rollers on a regular basis um, can have this issue. And, and unfortunately, if it's not treated, it can lead to permanent hair loss. Um, so it's very important to kind of like identify this condition early um, and talk to patients um, about treatment options. So, so I have a couple of other images. So the image on the far um, left is kind of a Sikh male who um, tied his hair really tight in a knot, and that could kind of pull, like I said, on the marginal hairline. Um, the other image is a female who wears a tight ponytail, um, which causes that hair loss. Um, so it's definitely due to kind of like chronic hair care practices that cause that chronic tension. So these are some kind of signs that you'll see on physical exam that could indicate that, hey, um, there's some inflammation going on and the hair follicles are inflamed. So you can see these follicular papules kind of at the base um, at the hair follicles. Um, so that's a sign that there's inflammation going on. And you'll also see the fringe sign um, with an image on the right. And this is where you have preservation of the anterior edge of the hairline, um, but hair loss kind of distal to that. So that's another sign that the patient could have traction alopecia. So these are some physical examples, um, physical signs that you want to look for. Um, so treatment options. So um, the first thing is you want to try to minimize the offending traction. Hold on one second. So this is a situation where um, you really want to be respectful of patients. Um, you know, they're, this is shared decision making, right? So you're not going to be like, don't ever wear braids again, right? You really want to be respectful of people's cultural practice, of people's preferences on how they style their hair. Um, so it's it's definitely a conversation, um, but it's really important to have shared decision making um, and respect people's beliefs, right? Um, so, but the bottom line is, um, if they're going to have some of similar hairstyles, um, make them less tight, so looser, or or take breaks. So if you have a certain hairstyle that's tight for a couple of weeks, if possible, maybe take a week or two break um, where you can wear your hair more loose and then you can go back to that. Or, or talk to your hairstylist to see if there's other options um, that you can do just so it's not that chronic pulling. Because like I said, it can lead to permanent hair loss that's really hard to reverse. Also important tips to talk to your patients is about kind of minimizing hair gel products that contain alcohol. Alcohol can kind of dry your hair, um, make it more brittle, so it'll break easier. Um, same thing with heat around the hairline, can cause dryness, make the hair more brittle. So to that end, you kind of wanna um, recommend more moisturization. If you see those follicular papules, um, you can do topical steroids or even intralesional corticosteroids to that area to help decrease the inflammation. And so this, this is something else that I wanted to kind of like have a small aside about is I think oftentimes we, we talk about kind of benign conditions, right? And so, so I kind of want to push back a little bit when we say benign, right? So I think oftentimes we're like benign, meaning like not cancer, right? Um, but oftentimes a lot of these conditions can cause, you know, um, quality of life issues like increased anxiety, depression, um, and especially a lot of these conditions affect the face, right? And so I know we're super busy when we see patients, right? Like we have 20 minutes at most to um, kind of take care of a lot of issues. Um, so oftentimes we might not even have time to address it or a patient may not bring it up to us because they may be embarrassed or they may have been told by a previous physician like, oh, you know, it's benign, you know, there's, you know, it's not, it's not very harmful. It's, you know, there's not much we can do about it. Um, so I, I would just challenge you guys that anytime you see these conditions, you know, not, you know, if you don't have time to address it at that moment, you're like, hey, I've noticed that you have some, some hair loss, or, or I noticed this on your skin, you know, uh, has anyone ever talked to you about, or, you know, we can schedule another visit to kind of talk more about it. Um, so just wanted to highlight the importance um, of kind of really talking to our patients about it, because they may not bring it up, they may not think it's a big deal, or they may be embarrassed to bring it up. So just wanted to have a quick aside to talk about that. Um, 
So keloids are those like shiny, thick, fibrous nodules um, that you'll get. It's an abnormal proliferation um, of scar tissue. Very common in skin of color patients. Um, and, and again, like um, these conditions, you know, especially keloids, they can have pain, they can be itchy. If they're big enough, they can pull at surrounding structures. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't know if I'd call this a benign condition. It, it'll never be cancer, but like, I, I don't know if I would call it benign, uh, for patients who are suffering. Um, so this is where it kind of like type three collagen, um, abnormally changes to type one collagen causing that proliferation. Um, anytime there's some sort of like trauma to the skin or an inciting event, um, there's a potential for keloid development. It can take up to 12 months, um, to develop keloids after the inciting event. Um, and some people even get spontaneous keloids where there's no clear trauma to the skin. Um, this happens typically in high tension areas like, you know, the chest or the back. Um, as you guys know, keloids are different from hypertrophic scars. So hypertrophic scars are generally, they're contained within the site of injury and usually regress over time, where keloids extend beyond the boundary of the initial injury and do tend to get bigger over time. So anytime you're talking about a surgical procedure with a patient or you're referring them to surgery, you want to have that conversation like, hey, is there anyone with keloids in your family? Do you have a personal history of keloids? And, you know, obviously, if, if someone needs surgery and it's necessary, like, that's fine. Um, but there are ways to help mitigate um, keloid developments. Um, so I just want you guys to keep that in mind when you're having these conversations with patients, um, that you want to talk about the risk benefit ratio, especially if patients already have keloids. So just wanted to point that out. So options, um, excision is, is always an option, but there is a very high rate of recurrence, right? And so, um, if you're thinking about doing this, um, it may be good to partner with dermatology um, because there are some things that you can do to kind of mitigate the recurrence of this. Um, kind of like you can inject intraditional steroids kind of like into the wound. Um, that helps. Um, but usually for excision, I often refer people to derm. Um, but intralesional corticosteroids are kind of the mainstay of treatment. And this is something we can easily do, right? And so this is usually reserved for kind of like smaller keloids. So if someone has an earlobe, earlobe keloid, you probably are not, you're probably not gonna do that because it's not gonna have a great benefit. Um, so when, when I do these, I really try to do like high concentrations of Kenalog or Trinsimalone with low volumes, okay? And so I'm talking like 40, 40 milligrams of Kinalog. And so you want to inject directly into the keloid. I'll usually kind of like tunnel in the needle. And then as I withdraw the needle, then I'll inject. Um, and you just want to inject it until it blanches. So oftentimes people will need several treatments, um, kind of like four to six weeks apart. Um, and it does take months, um, but eventually the keloid will flatten. Um, so you do want to talk about um, side effects. Like oftentimes people will have hypopigmentation when they have steroid treatments. So I always talk about these risks. Um, pulse dye laser treatment is extremely effective um, for keloids, but obviously dermatology does that. So if some of these options, um, if you're not comfortable with it or um, if it's really extensive, you want to refer them to derm for these other options. Corral surgery is also really good, um, especially for smaller keloids. Same concept though with the dyspigmentation dispigmentation side effects. So just, just make sure to counsel your patients about that possibility. Um, I, I definitely, I feel like it would be inappropriate, honestly, for me not to give this kind of talk and not include um, hydradenitis or perativa. It's this like these painful nodules, um, tunnels, sinus tract that can cause um, severe scarring um, in patients. So I, I definitely wanted to talk about this. Um, like kind of like over the last few months, I was just reading more about this condition. And then some, some of the like, some of the leaders in this condition were kind of talking about it, that it's a systemic inflammatory disorder. And that, that concept kind of like blew my mind, but like, it, you know, it makes a lot of sense to think of it as a systemic disorder. Um, so it's systemic inflammatory disorder with skin manifestations. So specifically a follicular occlusion disorder. So basically the hair follicle gets plugged, Eventually, the phyllosebaceous unit just ruptures, 
causing this intense inflammatory reaction um, that leads to these nodules. Um, so very painful in sinus tracts. So usually this is not, this is not an infectious disease. Um, it's an inflammatory disease. So obviously people can get secondary um, bacterial infections. Um, but if people have these nodules and you perform an IND, um, they'll usually just grow out just like normal skin flora. Um, so that's, that's really important to keep in mind when you're thinking about treatment. Um, this statistic is pretty sobering, but there's an average of seven, a seven year delay in diagnosis, which is like just very sad. So, so these patients really suffer for a long period of time and they can, until they can get an accurate diagnosis. There's a strong association with tobacco use um, and also obesity. Um, and that's due to kind of the increased skin friction, um, the sweat production retention leading to hormonal changes and androgen excess. Um, oh, I also I also didn't mention. So obviously it, it, it can occur anywhere where skin touches skin. So axilla, groin. Um, I, I saw a patient like two months ago who had a couple lesions under her breast. Um, and kind of similar to what I told you about that stat, like, you know, she had had this issue for like years and like no one really knew what it was. She kept being placed on antibiotics and it got better, but like it kept coming back. And so she had inframammary um, hydradenitis. So, so anywhere where skin touches skin, um, you can have this. Um, so again, it can drastically affect uh, patients' quality of life. Uh, patients with HS have higher have a higher prevalence of anxiety, depression, um, and suicide. Um, it's just like the pain, the draining, um, and the odor that can have like really plays a big role. Um, it's also, it can be associated with other conditions. Um, so other follicular occlusion disorders like uh, pyelonidal cyst, um, dissecting scalp cellulitis, um, acne colon blotta. Um, so all these are follicular occlusion disorders and can have an association with this. Um, um, inflammatory, um, like Crohn's disease also has a higher incidence of HS. Um, so just wanted to be aware there are some associations. Um, so, so with HS, I'll definitely do a lot of counseling on, um, tobacco cessation um, and weight loss because that will improve um, this condition. So looking at treatment options, um, as you guys know, the topical antiseptics um, are very uh, popular um, and helpful. Topical antibiotics, usually it's kind of for several months. Um, topical resorcinol, 15%. Um, so that's, that's an, um, it's not an antibiotic. So if you're concerned about antibiotic resistance, um, you can consider that. If people have like kind of single or two nodules, again, you can utilize um, intralesional corticosteroid injections to really help with the inflammation. Um, if that doesn't help, then you can think more of kind of like long-term oral antibiotics like doxycycline or a combination of rifampicin and clindamycin. If people have um, kind of a hormonal component um, to HS, like if they flare during their menstrual cycle um, due to the androgen excess, um, you can think about hormonal therapies like um, metformin, spironolactone, finasteride, um, combined OCPs, um, for example, can be helpful if there's a hormonal um, component to their flares. All right, so I think this is one of my the last conditions. Um, so post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So unfortunately, with many of these conditions, I talked a little bit about the pigmentary um, sequelae that you can have. Um, so PIH is is very common um, with some of these, or associated with some of these conditions. For example, acne. Um, oftentimes, um, this is kind of more important to the patient than the underlying condition itself, or it'll be the hyperpigmentation that like brings them into the office as opposed to the underlying condition. So, so patients do care, care about this. Um, so this is kind of like excessive melanin deposition in the dermal layers. Um, it's more pronounced and persistent in skin of color, but like all skin types can obviously get um, PIH. Um, so it's common in acne, atopic dermatitis. We already talked about um, PFB earlier in this talk. Um, resolution can take months to years. Um, so the most important thing is to treat the underlying condition first. Like if the underlying condition is not well controlled, um, you're really not going to get anywhere um, with the PIH treatment. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're talking about treatment options. So 
there's like over a dozen pathways um, when it comes to melanin production. Um, I'm just going to focus on three. So melanin production, transfer of melanin, and then the deposition in the keratinocytes and the dermal layers. So it's important to think about these because like when you're thinking about treatment options, you want to see how you can impact one, two, or all of these pathways. Uh, so just wanted to tell you a little bit about the mel melanin um, pathways. Uh, so treatment options. So hydroquinone is is the gold standard, right? It's been around for decades. Um, it is extremely effective. Um, it's a uh, it inhibits the tyrosinous um, enzyme, and like it's like I said, it's very effective. Um, unfortunately, it's not safe in pregnancy or breastfeeding women, um, so you want to keep that in mind. And also, the really important thing is that you cannot use this more than six months because it can cause rebound um, hyperpigmentation that's often extremely hard to treat. So six months max, and then you can take a break for a month or two, and then you can go back at it. Retinoids uh, target all three pathways. So they're amazing for this condition. And obviously they're great for acne too. Like retinoids are just, they're just amazing for a lot of different conditions. And as you know, adapalene, cesaretine, they're over-the-counter options and tretinoin is prescription. So um, retinoids are really good for this condition. Um, azelaic acid, it's good for acne, rosacea, and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So that's a really good option. Um, salicylic acid has anti-inflammatory um, properties. There's oral options too. And I just listed um, kind of these other ingredients and active ingredients that you may have seen. So kojic acid, licorice root, vitamin C, niacinamide um, is, is a type of ceramide moisturizer and soy. Um, so anything with these ingredients are also really good um, for PIH. Um, obviously, like chemical peels and laser treatments are what Derm can offer. So it's really extensive or if um, these other treatments are not um, not really effective, you can refer to Derm. Um, the, again, really important um, is sunscreen because um, I know the sun is nice. We, we like the sun, um, but it can definitely activate um, the melanocytes and kind of trigger um, PIH, um, especially in some of these conditions. So you really wanna counsel on sunscreen. And, and honestly, if like, if patients are not gonna wear sunscreen, like you're, you're basically wasting your time talking about treatment options because the PIH is just gonna come back. And so talking about sunscreen is super important um, when it, I mean, all of our patients, regardless of their skin type, um, but specifically PIH. Um, so, so again, talking about sunscreen, right? It's important for everyone, regardless of their skin type. Um, for me, I was, you know, I was under the false assumption, like, oh, you know, as an African American, you know, I can't really get a sunscreen. And, and I, you know, I took a vacation with a friend in Mexico and, you know, we went to the, these pyramids kind of an hour North of Mexico city. And, you know, we got there super early. We wanted to see, we wanted to see the sunrise and beat the crowds. So we saw the sunrise and we just kind of like, took a nap and just like, we're, we're looking up like that at the sun. And um, like an hour and a half later, like when I woke up, like my skin was like a little itchy and I was like, okay, that's, that's a little weird. And then it was like burning. And I was like, like, what is going on? And then I realized I had a sunburn. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've never had a sunburn. And I'm like mid twenties and this could happen to me. And like, it was just like mind blowing. Um, so, so anyway, sunscreen is super important, um, especially for photo exacerbated conditions. Um, so Anytime you talk about sunscreen, like I tell people like any sunscreen you want to wear, like I don't care what, like anything you want to wear, as long as you wear it is great. Um, but the really important things you want to talk to patients about are broad spectrum, UVA, UVB protection, and invisible light coverage with at least an SPF of 30 plus. And so kind of darker skin types have a natural SPF of five to 10, but that's not going to get you to 30. So, so regardless, it needs to be at least SPF 30. There's two different types of sunscreens. There's physical or mineral sunscreens, and then there's chemical sunscreens. So the physical or mineral sunscreens, unfortunately, they can leave a white cast. Um, and so oftentimes when I'm talking to skin of color patients, they're like, you know, when I wear sunscreen, I get this white cast. You know, I, I don't like it a lot. It's like really cakey. Um, so because of that, they don't like wearing sunscreens. Um, but luckily, they have micronized um, ingredients now of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide that minimizes the white cast. People can get tinted versions that can also minimize the white cast. 
Um, mineral sunscreens are overall better for people with sensitive skin, um, patients with acne, um, and children. Um, so generally speaking, I will recommend um, a mineral or physical sunscreen. Um, I like I like different ones. I like Super Bloop Unseen. I like um, Black Girl Sunscreen. I like Elta MD. There, there's a ton of recommendations that are really good. Um, so anyway, so those are just some options. Chemical sunscreens are like a sponge. They absorb the UV rays, convert them to thermal energy. They don't leave a white cast. Oftentimes they're easier to apply and more even. So patients may prefer this one. Either way, as long as you're wearing something, that's that's better than nothing. So finally, I just want to talk about some resources that I have found like very helpful in my education of um, skin of color conditions. Um, so the first one is, you know, is a textbook. I know like, yeah, we, we still use textbooks. I still find textbooks helpful. Um, but Taylor and Kelly's dermatology for skin of color is, is just excellent. Um, it is very comprehensive. It has a ton of um, images and explanations. And, and treatment options. So that's that's probably like my favorite one. Um, you guys probably already know Visual DX. It's an amazing database um, with tons of images. Um, and it does have a, a nice, it does have a nice section for skin of color images. Um, and and some some EHRs are have Visual DX integrated. So so that's also a nice feature. Um, the American Academy of Dermatology Skin of Color um, curriculum is a free curriculum with kind of like 10 modules um, that are very helpful um, in looking and diagnosing and treatment skin of color conditions. Um, so these are just some resources um, that you guys can check out. Um, Beyond Skin um, is the book by um, that amazing med medical student who illustrates as well, um, Chidiberry Ebay. And so he has a number of like amazing examples um, as well in his book. Um, so I just wanted to give you some, some examples. So finally, just to end, um, just wanted to kind of revisit these learning objectives. Um, so we examined factors um, that contribute to skin of color health disparities. We discussed um, common dermatological conditions in skin of color. And the last piece, we kind of touched on some educational resources for you guys to continue your education. Um, so with that, um, I will stop and kind of stop share and, and just say like, Really appreciate the time and talking to you guys and happy to answer any questions that you have. I see one question in the chat about how often should patients with PIH use those topical meds daily, BID, yeah. TID, and how many weeks do you recommend them to use the topicals? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. So azelaic acid, they can use every day. Glycolic acid, you can use every day. A, a lot of these are daily. Um, hydroquinone, daily. Um, the, the one medication that you want to be careful about is trednoin. Um, trednoin can be very irritating um, to patient's skin, especially patients with sensitive skin. So I always tell patients, um, put a moisturizer first, use just once a week for a couple of weeks, and then go to twice a week, and then eventually go to every night, okay? So trednoin, um, the retinoids, you have to be very careful, and they really have to build up to that. Um, some patients who are especially sensitive, I tell them to use a sandwich method where they put moisturization before um, and after. Um, so that's the main one, but these are daily medications and and you keep using them until the, the PAH goes away. Hydroquinone is the only one where you really like, it's like six months, that's a hard cutoff. You definitely want to stop it after six months and take at least a month or two break because like I said, they can't have the rebound hyperpigmentation, which can oftentimes be permanent, um, but the rest of them you can continue. So good question. What else? I have a lot of questions. Uh, sure. If uh, no one has, but my first question is, uh, you said like um, people can like do the massage after shaving and it'd be great if you can like teach us like how to um, provide a patient education again, like, how to do, how yeah. many minutes, like. Yeah, so this is just like a circular, just a circular massage. The point, the point of that massage is if any hair is kind of like stuck, um, kind of doing a gentle massage will unstick those hairs. 
So I tell people to do it for approximately five minutes. Um, and that's kind of the last step in the shaving process. And I tell them to repeat it in 12 hours because in 12 hours, some hair will have retracted. Some hairs may have started to curve back into the skin. So doing that kind of circular massaging um, will help unstick those hairs. And so I just tell them to do it five minutes for the last step and then repeat it in 12 hours, just a gentle circular motion. Yeah, I know it's a lot of steps. It's it's a lot, but but it does help. Like some people, which I'm not, I don't recommend, but they like they go to a mirror and literally like look at hairs that are like stuck and like manually like unstick hairs one by one. And like some people are like very dedicated to that, but like I just tell people just do the massage and hopefully that that does the job. Okay, this is my last question so for the treatment of traction alpecia we with inflammation i think you said uh, you, we can use the topical steroid which yeah. strength do you recommend so i usually recommend low dose or low potency mm -hmm. um i should say um again because it's on the face um that skin is pretty sensitive um so for the topical just kind of like low dose or low potency thank you yeah you're welcome yeah, definitely. Yeah, these are good questions. Anything else? Seeing or hearing no other questions, so I will extend a big thank you, Dr. Frazier. That was an excellent yeah, talk. I might already you. have that uh, Skin of Color book coming to my house on Monday now. Um, <laughs> Great. And for those Let's of you go. on the talk, um, please refer to the link that Bill dropped in the chat to report your, to do the survey and report the CME. So, um, everybody enjoy your night. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.